Hello friends and welcome to our video lecture on topic S2.4 from Models to Materials. Our guiding question for today, what role do bonding and structure have in the design of materials? These are our understandings for the day. Please note that there are a couple content statements from this topic that I'm going to save for our organic chemistry unit. These are both about polymers, which I think make more sense when, we're, when we've been talking about some organic molecules first. And our objectives for today, we are going to take a look at the Van Arco Ketelar bonding triangle that helps us to classify bonds as being ionic, covalent, metallic, or something in the middle. We're going to look at some generalizations about bonding and properties. Then we're going to look at some super interesting examples of exceptions to those generalizations, silicon, aluminum chloride, and then some alloys. And here's our Van Arkel Ketelar triangle. It is section 17 of the data booklet, should you want to open up that data booklet and take a look. It is going to graph electronegativity difference of the two atoms involved in a bond on the y-axis. The x-axis is the average of the electronegativities of the two atoms in any given bond. We can look at the ionic versus covalent percentage of these bonds. The bigger the electronegativity difference, the more ionic it is, the lesser the electronegativity difference, the more covalent it is. Please note that despite the pretty distinct lines between ionic, covalent, and metallic, it is in fact a continuum. And so we've got super metallic things and then less metallic, starting to be a little bit ionic, but just barely ionic, but then super ionic. And the same thing along the covalent lines. What's lovely about this triangle is that it allows us to make predictions about the properties of substances, and then we can choose the substances that we want to design new things, to solve problems, or to make machines better. This table is showing us lots of properties and then predictions related to those properties regarding the bonding that we're going to find in any given substance. For example, if I have a metallic structure, probably going to have some pretty high conductivity, but also really low volatility. We have talked about the great majority of these properties already in our last couple lecture videos. We haven't talked about brittleness. This is basically just the opposite of malleability. So metals are malleable, which means that they are not brittle, whereas ionic structures, those lattices, are going to be more brittle, less malleable. Susceptibility to corrosion, this is the likelihood of a substance rusting. Metals in the presence of water and oxygen are far more likely to rust, whereas a covalent network solid like silicon or diamond, probably not going to see a lot of rusting happening. Two other interesting properties that vary amongst our different types of bonds are elasticity and plasticity. Elasticity is the ability to get bent or pulled or stretched, but then return to your original shape. So a rubber band would be considered elastic. You can pull on it, you let it go, it goes back to its original shape and size. Metals tend to have more plasticity, so you can bend it and it's going to stay in that new bent form. And even though we can often predict properties of substances based just on the type of bonding present, sometimes there are variations. And our Van Arkel Ketelar triangle lets us know when to expect some of those variations. For example, let's look at this group of potassium halides. Potassium is a metal, and we're going to bond potassium to the group of halogens. Halogens are here. We're going to look at the same group of halides bound to silver, Silver is also a metal, it's a transition metal, it's here on the periodic table. So the electronegativity of potassium is 0 0.8. The electronegativity of fluorine is 4.0. That means that the difference in electronegativity for these two atoms is going to be 3.2. If I were to graph that on my y-axis, it is right there at the tippy top. My average electronegativity for these two atoms is going to be 2.4. 2.4 is about here, so my point of intersection is going to be at the tippy top of the ionic piece of my Van Arkel Ketelar triangle. This guy is super ionic. It has a pretty high melting point. 
Notice that as I increase the size of my halogen, our melting point decreases. That's because the electronegativity is going to get lower and lower, which means that the difference is going to get smaller and smaller. The average is also going to get smaller and smaller. We're still going to stay in that ionic part of the triangle, but this is not as ionic as is this. Therefore, the melting point is declining just a little bit. However, when we look at our silver halides, the trend is not the same. We are instead going to be looking at an electronegativity of silver equal to 1.9, twice that of potassium. Fluorine is still that 4.0. The difference in electronegativity is going to be only 2.1. We're here on our y-axis. The average electronegativity is only about 2.95. Now we're way over here. Notice that we are, oh my goodness, in polar covalent land. This guy is going to have a much lower melting point because it's a little bit more covalent than it is ionic. Another substance that has some properties that you would not expect given its type of bonding is silicon. Silicon is here in the same family as carbon on the periodic table. It has four valence electrons just like carbon and also just like carbon it can form network covalent solids. So remember that this is where we have nonmetal atoms sharing electrons, but they're forming a lattice much like an ionic compound. So we've got atoms that are regularly spaced. They are sharing electrons, so again, a covalent bond, but it's an undefined number, so it can be quite large. Super high melting points due to this lattice structure. Unlike carbon and its amazing diamond structure, because silicon's a little bit bigger than carbon, these bonds are not quite as strong, and so silicon is not as strong as is diamond. But it looks like a metal. Silicon, despite having covalent bonds, also has some metallic properties. It's lustrous. It can also conduct electricity, but because it's a semiconductor, it conducts electricity only if it's heated or we shine some light on it or add some impurities or do something to kind of instigate that conductivity. Why does silicon have these metallic properties? Well, let's look at the electronegativities and our Van Arkel Kettler triangle. The electronegativity of silicon is 1.9. The difference between silicon and silicon, of course, is going to be zero, so that's our y-axis number. Our average 1.9 and 1.9 is going to be, of course, 1.9, which is here. Oh my goodness, look where it lies on our Van arkel kettler triangle, right on the border of metallic and covalent. This guy does have some covalent properties. It's brittle. It is not malleable like a metal. If I hit it with a hammer, it's going to shatter into lots of pieces instead of dent. It is also going to form acidic oxides if I react it with water. Remember that metals form basic oxides, whereas nonmetals form those acidic oxides. But it's a semiconductor. It can conduct electricity, and it's shiny like a metal. Another substance that displays some unexpected properties given its bonding type is aluminum chloride. Aluminum is a metal, chlorine is a non-metal, metal non-metal non should make an ionic compound that has ionic properties. And aluminum chloride does have some ionic properties, but it also has some covalent properties. Let's look at the electronegativities to figure out why. Aluminum is 1.6 and chlorine is 3.2. The average of these two is going to be 2.4. That's like right there. The difference is 1.6, like right there. When I put these on my graph, we're right at the edge of ionic and polar covalent. And so this guy, this substance, does show both ionic and covalent properties. Under normal pressure, it is going to form the expected ionic lattice. It has a pretty high melting point. However, if I subject it to very high pressure, it instead forms what we call a dimer. 
Dimers are formed from two units. That's the dye part of dimer. Here we can see one aluminum with the three fluorines. Here's my other one aluminum with three fluorines. Those are the two pieces that make up the dimer. This, again, only under high pressure, has a melting point of only 190 degrees Celsius. That is really low for something that we would expect to be covalent. Interestingly, it also is soluble in nonpolar solvents. Usually, ionic compounds will dissolve in water, which is quite polar. Aluminum chloride will dissolve in nonpolar solvents. We're going to look at several examples of alloys and how they have some properties that are not predicted for metallic structures, despite alloys being mixtures of metals. We call alloys mixtures instead of compounds because there is no fixed proportion. Remember in our definition of compounds, we are going to have fixed or set proportions. Water is always H2O, hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. Despite these having both hydrogen and oxygen, the different proportions lead to different compounds. That is not true of alloys. Brass is a mixture of copper and zinc. Sometimes I have a little more zinc, sometimes I have a little less zinc, it's still brass. And so there is no fixed proportion, therefore it's a mixture, not a compound. What's pretty cool about having these mixtures of metal cations in these metallic structures is that we are going to reduce the malleability of the substance. Remember that malleability of metals is due to the sea of free electrons flowing around all those metal cations. And if I pound a piece of the metal, we can just shift entire rows of cations over because of the multi-directionality of the forces of attraction between the sea of electrons and those metal cations. But if I introduce cations of different sizes, now we don't have that lovely, regularly spaced rows and columns of, of cations. Instead, I've got a little bit of a mess. And that little bit of a mess means that if I try to pound it, these guys just can't slide around each other as easily. So alloys are far less malleable than regular pure metals. And just for fun, here are a couple super cool examples of alloys, really weird and super cool examples. This one is sodium potassium alloy. It has a crazy low melting point and it is actually a liquid at room temperature because it is in that liquid phase, we can use it to cool nuclear reactors. This one is an example of a shape memory alloy. So we've got some shape of this alloy. When it's cold, we can bend it. It's malleable, it's ductile. It is going to keep that new shape, but oh my gosh, if you heat it up, it pops right back to the original shape. How cool is that? An amazing property of alloys that we humans absolutely take advantage of when we're designing materials, especially for structures, is another unexpected property given that alloys are metallic structures. Alloys are far less susceptible to corrosion, rusting, than our pure metals. Here we have a pipe made of steel. Steel is an alloy that is primarily iron and carbon. There is a little bit of rusting on these pipes, but not nearly as much as we would expect if we had pure iron. Here we have galvanized steel. Galvanizing steel adds either a protective barrier to the outside or we have a sacrificial barrier that then turns into some kind of protective barrier. We can paint with some kind of rust proofing paint our alloys. That'll be a lovely barrier. Or we can add, again, that sacrificial barrier. Stainless steel has a sacrificial barrier of chromium. So what happens when this stainless steel is exposed to oxygen is that the chromium is actually going to be oxidized. That is going to lead to the production of this layer of chromium oxide on the outside of our piece of steel. That is going to set up a barrier, so no further oxidation of the actual steel will occur. All of that chromium was sacrificed, hence that sacrificial layer, to produce that barrier to protect the rest of the alloy. 
And perhaps the two most commonly known alloys are those of copper, brass, and bronze. Brass is an alloy of zinc and copper, whereas bronze is an alloy of tin and copper. Brass, despite being an alloy, is still fairly malleable. It's also got some pretty fantastic acoustic properties, and so we use it to make a lot of musical instruments. Interestingly, brass also has some pretty fantastic antimicrobial properties, and so we put it on door handles of public spaces like in hospitals. Bronze is significantly stronger than is copper. We used to use it quite a bit to build tools and in shipbuilding, and then of course, to make coins. And hopefully we're feeling pretty confident about our abilities to answer the guiding question, what role do bonding and structure have in the design of materials? Because if we can predict the properties of materials, then we know which ones to choose when we're building things or designing machines or solving problems that humans face. In order to figure out bonding, we need to know our Van Arkel Kettler bonding triangle. We talked about some generalizations of bonding and properties, and then all those super interesting exceptions, silicon, aluminum chloride, and that set of alloys that we looked at today. Great work, my friends.